I'd like to welcome at this moment those who are sharing with us on the internet and it's good to be able to know that there are others out there sharing in this time together. I'd like to ask David to come to bring to us a reading please from uh, Galatians chapter 4. What am I saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the holy state. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we are underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of my illness, of an illness, that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcome me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessings of me now? I can testify that, if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over but for no good reason. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you, may be, so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. Amen. Thank you, David. Probably the time when you may hear people saying thanks more throughout the world at the same time is Christmas. Anybody notice that? Christmas. Whether they're giving thanks for the right things or not may be a different thing altogether. And you know, just this past week, somebody was complaining on Facebook. Have you ever heard of Facebook? Anybody here? Right. Somebody was complaining on Facebook. And they were complaining because they went into the shops and there were all these Christmas cards in August. You know, we've, we've not had any of the other things we think should come before Christmas. And there it is, Christmas cards. And for them, it was something they weren't saying thank you for. That was quite clear. They thought this was terrible. Celebrating Christmas in August. I'm kind of reminded that there are some people who actually celebrate Christmas in March. I don't know whether you're aware of that. Most of them live in the town of March, of course. But it doesn't matter what date it is. 
But does it really matter what date it is? Uh, 25th of December, 25th of June, whatever date is immaterial. Uh, going back when Christmas was first thought about, it was chosen. Not because that's when we believe Jesus was born. The reality is we don't know what precise date he was born. It was chosen at a time when those early converts were so easily swayed by the, the uh, celebrations of the pagan world from which they were converted. Something had to be given to them, it was thought. So why don't we give this as a time when we specifically will remember the birth of Christ? And so we're not saying this is the birthday of Christ when it comes to Christmas. We're saying this is a time when we will specifically remember the birth of Christ. A tremendous opportunity to bring some things before the world that surrounds us. And you know when Paul is writing this particular chapter that David kindly read for us, when Paul was writing this, there is a sense in which he is saying, I am thankful for Christmas. Except they didn't use the word Christmas then. It hadn't been invented. But when you look at the words that have been said here, the whole essence is about the coming of Christ. Yeah, just like what we say at Christmas. The greatest gift the world could ever know. God's gift of his son, the Lord Jesus. God's gift. When should it be? Well, Paul makes it pretty clear here. It's in the fullness of God's time. In the fullness of God's time. Doesn't matter about anything else. It's in the fullness of God's time. And in the fullness of God's time, Paul is saying, God gave to us a special gift. God gave to us a gift that's greater than anything the world could ever give. He gave to us the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus. And as he goes through this chapter, so he goes, goes on to speak about what this gift meant to him. So you remember when it comes to the 25th of December, you know, you've got it in advance. This is what it's all about. When Paul is speaking about the coming of Jesus, he is speaking to people who clearly had forgotten what their faith was about. They got involved with all the legalism when they had it already. The gift of the Son, Jesus. They'd had it already. And in the gift of the Son of the Lord, uh, in the gift of Jesus, the Son of God, we see that gift that comes to us, a gift of redemption. Redemption. That's why God gave his Son for us. Redemption. Redemption. They were slaves. The people he was writing to, they were effectively, they were living as if they were slaves. Slaves to the things of this world. All that mattered to them was the religiosity, not the relationship. All that mattered to them was the legalism when God wanted them to know freedom. Freedom. And the slaves of those days were, would be overjoyed to find that somebody had redeemed them from their slavery. Redeemed them from their slavery. That they may be set free. They may be set free. That's what God gave to us. When he gave the gift of his son, Jesus, he was giving to us freedom. Freedom. As we are redeemed from the sins of our lives. We are redeemed that we might live as free men, free women. Free men, free women. Do you know when uh, we go back to the Gospels uh, and we see about the, the Christmas story? And um, Jesus was going to get that name. It was quite clear, a message from heaven. Why? Because he would save his pe the people from their sins. Jesus actually means that. It means that he's going to be a saviour. And so when Jesus came, then salvation came. 
When Jesus came, our Saviour was here and we had nothing else to look to but him that we might discover in him comes freedom. Freedom. That redemption that's pointing to Easter. That redemption that's pointing towards the time when Jesus would die on the cross of Calvary. For us. For us. He's going to take our punishment. He's going to take it all. And on the cross, there are the sins of the world. There are the sins of the world. And on the third day, he rises again to newness of life. To newness of life. He's done all of that that we might know the gift. The gift of freedom, the gift of salvation, the gift of the joy of the Lord in our lives. Great, isn't it? The wonderful things God did for us. The pain he took for us the heartache he took for us, that we might know the gift of his love. His love. Now we're going to keep on that analogy of Christmas. Do you remember when you come to that time and people put the, uh, the presents out? You look at the presents, and when you look at the presents, you can see there's a name, your name is on that particular present. And wow, that's mine. It's mine. It's got my name on it. But it's not fully ours. It's not fully yours. Until the time comes when, when that present is unwrapped. The item within it is taken out. And you possess it. It's an item of clothing. You'll wear it. Uh, for the children, they're going to play with whatever toy it's going to be. They possessed it, it's theirs. It isn't just a name upon a parcel. It is theirs. They own it wholly, completely. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, sent him to die on the cross for us. Even at the very beginning, we see him as a man, as a babe that was rejected. Remember the story? And they went from one end to another. And hearing that same message, no room in the inn, no room in the inn, until I came to that one particular inn. And once again, there's no room in my inn. Oh, but hang on a minute. I've got a stable around the back. Do you fancy going in there? It's all I've got, but this is what I give to you. And we may not have very much. But you know, God's looking for us to say, well, no, I haven't got very much, but what I have, I give to you. I give to you my life. I give to you my heart. I give to you my everything. And in you, I give to you everything that I could ever have and would ever have. Trust in you, because you are my redeemer. You have redeemed me. In this moment when I trusted Jesus as my saviour, I know that redemption, it's mine, it's mine. But you know when Paul, when Paul is speaking to the Galatians, he speaks about redemption, yes, but he speaks also about relationship, relationship. What wonderful words we've got there. What wonderful words we've got here. God sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. And you know those words, Abba, Father, speak to me of the closeness of the relationship that we can know with our Father. Because of Jesus. Abba, Father. In those words, we've got Father. We can't understand what that means. Father, and it's a very formal title. Father of the one who's our, uh, the one we look to as one, uh, as our mum or dad, as it were. And yet more formal than that. But the word Abba, we don't normally have in our English language. And really, we can't translate 
the word that's being used here accurately into what we have in our English language. And so when he says Abba, yes, he's saying, yes, here is somebody I speak to with respect as a father, and yet there's an informality, just like a young child would say, Daddy, Daddy. Abba, Father, yeah, we respect him, we should respect him. Every one of us should come to that point of respecting him. Yet at the same time, to know we've got a closeness that we can come up to him and say, Daddy, we've got a closeness that we can come up to him and have that, that informality with him as well as being respectful. How do we express that? Well, I guess in our language we find it very difficult to do so. And yet, what is important is to know that God's made it possible to have that close relationship with him. Close relationship with him. And in that moment, to know that freedom is theirs. It's there, not because we have a religion, but because we've got a relationship. That freedom is ours because he has made it possible. He has made it possible. When we look at the early verses of this chapter, and go, Paul goes on to speak about uh, how as, a, as the heir is a child, he doesn't differ at all from a slave. No, he's just the same. Uh, yeah, he's a part of the family that owns it all. Owns it all but he's still subject to those who are his guardians and will be until the day comes in God's timing. In the fullness of time, it will come. In the fullness of time, we can look forward to it. That's how it was before we came to know Christ as our Saviour. We were no different. We were no different. But when we have that spirit within us, speaking with us, saying, Abba, Father, we are at that moment no longer a slave. No longer like a slave. And no longer a slave. But we're a son. And if a son, then we are an heir through God. An heir through God. We are heirs. He's made us free. And we are the heirs, we, are the, we have the inheritance of the most wondrous kingdom that could ever be known. We've got that to look forward to. Tremendous, isn't it? Wonderful that God's given to us what we do not deserve. We don't deserve any of it. And yet, it's for you. And it's for me. It's for us. When we get beyond looking at the name and discovering the parcel within. Knowing the parcel within. He's come. Jesus came. Yes. He was there in a sense. The Son of God was there eternally. Uh, right from the very beginning when John wrote the first uh, Gospel of John. Uh, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. In the beginning. And who was the word? Well, we read on in that first chapter of John's Gospel and we discover the answer. The word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. And who was it? But Jesus, the Son of God, became, came in the flesh at that moment of time in the fullness of God's time. It all came to pass. It all came to pass. Great when we can see what Paul is saying here. To know that he is speaking of the coming of Christ. Yeah, that one who came as a babe and then died on the cross of Calvary. That coming of Christ brings to us the whole aspect of our redemption. To know that aspect of salvation, to know the sins that we are tied to, we are slaves to, can be put in the past, that we can look forward 
with confidence that Jesus has now made everything just right. It's a gift then of our redemption. It's a gift of our relationship. And I am surely very thankful. God loved me so much. He gave me that. Do you feel the same? God loves you so much. He's given you all of that. And so when we speak about thank you for the coming of Christ, here is where our thanks always should be. We can do all the kind of celebrations throughout the year. Whatever celebrations we may want, whatever celebrations we desire, we can do them. We can party. We can put decorations up. We can do all of those kind of things. And we can sing special songs. All of that. Any time through the year. But you know, beyond that, in the fullness of God's time. In the fullness of God's time. We can discover. It's more than the party. It's the relationship. We can know in him. In the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. And it could be, for some of us, today, the fullness of time. Now, we come to realise how personal that is for us. And it is personal. For you, for me, it's personal. Uh, Joan and I used to live in Cyprus some years ago, in the 70s. Uh, and uh, we had a, it was a wonderful fellowship that was there, by the nature of the fact that they were, they were all in, in the forces, so... They were going to be at a younger average age than the most churches in Sevy Street. They're all of working age. So they're all, that kind of immediately lowers the age, average age. And one of the things that we discovered was we hoped that, and we prayed that God would send in new, send in mature Christians, because we needed mature Christians to teach the young Christians that were there. And it didn't happen that way. Because what did happen is that people came to know Christ as their saviour. And God knew what we really needed was to have new babes in Christ. Worshipping with us, fellowshipping with us, learning together with us. And you know, when it came to Christmas time, not a lot of these men and women were single, living in the billets. And so there would be a special uh, opportunity for everybody to gather together at Christmas, not merely a Christmas service, in addition to that, just to have a, a light social time where they were away uh, from all the things of the billet. And during that time, some of the young people would speak about what Christmas meant to them that year, compared to the previous Christmas when they didn't know of it in a personal sense. And as they spoke together, as they shared together, so they said, you know, now I really know what Christmas is about. I thought I knew it was just about parties. That's what I thought it was about. But now I know it's because God loves me. And love is so important for every one of us. God loves me. Is there any greater love than to know the love of God? They'd come to the point of seeing that personal. And so when we speak about redemption, we speak about relationship, here is the, 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 something even more important. Are we ready? Are we ready today? If it was today, are we ready just to respond when we hear the call of the Master and say, yes, Lord, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here for you, as you have been here for me. As you are here for me. Do you remember the story of Samuel? It's the young child uh, who lived with the priest Eli. And he heard this voice in the middle of the night. All it said was, Samuel, Samuel. Well, Samuel heard the voice, it was so clear. 
distinct, and he knew there was only one person in that place other than him, and that was the old priest, Eli. So he ran through to Eli. He says, here I am, what does he want? Well, you know what it's like when a child disturbs you in the middle of the night? Well, probably it was like that for Eli. Go back to bed, Earth Samuel. Go back to bed. I never called you. Maybe you're dreaming. Just go back to bed. Well, he went back to bed and he heard the voice again. Eli. Sorry, Samuel. Samuel. And uh, he ran through. And eventually, the old man's kind of thinking kind of clicked in. He thought, oh, hang on a minute. This, he's clearly hearing a voice here. And it's not me. So who else could it be? So go back to bed, Samuel. But this time, when you hear the voice, say, yes, Lord, your servant heareth. Yes, Lord, your servant heareth. I'm hearing, I'm listening, and I want to respond to what you have to say. Well, are we ready for that? In the fullness of God's time in the fullness of God's time, that we would be ready for Jesus only. Only for Jesus. Ready that we might begin that relationship with Jesus and live it throughout our lives. Ready to receive that freedom in redemption God's given for us. We are ready trusting him wholly completely trusting him today and every day let's spend a few moments in prayer let's pray <coughs> blessed lord and heavenly father thank you thank you for the gift of your son Thank you that we can, we can have a Christmas every day. Don't we, we don't need the cards. We don't need the tinsel. We just need our hearts open for you. And so wherever we are, we've never done that before. At this moment, may we say, Lord, my heart is open for you. Come in. Come in to stay. I'm trusting you as Saviour. I'm trusting you as Lord, that we might know your forgiveness and how, how we, much we need it, your forgiveness in our lives. So we pray this in your name's sake. Amen. 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 Well, thanks to uh, the folks on the internet who have been uh, eavesdropping on us. Hopefully the time will come when you'll be able to not just do that but be able to come and join us here in Perry Baptist Church and uh, we look forward to meeting with you in person.